Welcome to M&A Mondays, the UK's first YouTube series dedicated to all things M&A. From interviews with the leading figures in the industry, to coffee chats with analysts, diversity panels, all the way through to workshops, we'll be covering it all. We do hope you enjoy the video and please give us a like and a follow on our social media. Thank you very much. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's M&A Monday, the UK's first YouTube series dedicated to all things M&A. My name is Nicola and I'm the head of speaker relations and today I'm joined by Charlotte, our speaker relations executive. Um, we are incredibly excited to have San uh, Zahid Munir with us today. Zahid studied uh, pharmacology at KCL and then went to the University of, uh, University of Cambridge to complete a master's in biochemistry, a PhD in pharmacology and most recently an MBA. He also has a great amount of work experience. He's worked in the financial so financial services team at PwC, Investment Bank and Nomura and HSBC, and is now the managing director and head of healthcare at BNP Paribas. We're incredibly delighted and grateful to have you with us today. So let's get started <laughs> with the interview. How are you doing today? Good, good morning and, and thank you for calling me on the interview. Uh, delighted to be here with you. And um, just for the first question, we wanted to start a bit with your uh, university background. So having studied uh, pharmacology and biochemistry throughout your years at university, what made you actually decide to go into finance? Yeah, so my, my uh, sort of educational background was predominantly around science. Uh, my focus had been around biochemistry, so I went, went um, did my master's AM fully in, at Cambridge, and then that transpired into a, a doctorate uh, program. Um, so I spent another sort of three years looking at the pharmacology of um, intracellular calcium signaling. Um, during that time, I had a lot of interaction with pharma companies, understanding their IP, how it was commercially. Um, made available and the whole drug development process. So that became quite attractive to me on seeing how lab science actually made it to the market and that process involved within that and then the market potential of various products. Um, so that, that was the background of me moving away, I, I guess, or at least integrating how the commercial side of the biopharma industry fits with um, traditional academic um, bench research. All right, thank, thank you for that. And so you first kind of started your career at PwC, which is um, kind of like auditing and consulting firms. So how did it differ from investment banking and its approach to the healthcare sector? So, so when I had reached the end of my um, academic career, I would, I would sort of say uh, that that phase of it um, coming with the conclusion of, of the PhD. Um, I had already decided that I was highly interested again around the commercialization of this, but in order to understand how biopharma companies, how companies in general work, um, it was it was necessary from my perspective to really get down to the nuts and bolts of how does a company operate, their, their P&L, their balance sheet, how do people view these, et cetera, and, how, and then how is that put into the context of the biopharma industry? So my perspective was to, to train up um, on the uh, bolts um, of company analysis, financial analysis, uh, looking at their accounts, the, the ratio analysis that's required, and then sort of starting to consider valuation. Um, so that that part of my, um, I would say, professional career was very, very useful in getting me up to speed on the financial aspects. So all, although I had spent a lot of time within the academic and the biopharma um, uh, sort of that angle of, of my career, um, I wanted to really make sure I understood the, the nuts and bolts of the financials um, of, of a company and traditional way of analyzing them and so forth. So that helped me immensely to really then be positioned 
on both the pharma side and on the financial side on the analysis of a company. Um, at that point, I was very well positioned <coughs> to move into a more um, investment banking focus oriented role where, where valuation is, is critical. So without going in, in, into detail of each of the, the platforms I was in, but the underlying um, required skill was a deep understanding of the operational uh, aspects of the company. So what were the, the pipeline, what were the drugs being developed, how you value that, and then you know the products that were on the market, how that's valued, how you integrate risk within your evaluation models. Um, and that's just one aspect, right? So that's just looking at the pharma biofarm aspect um, within healthcare. Then you've also got more traditional product orientated subsectors within healthcare such as medtech. Um, you've then got services within pharmacies etc. How are they valued? Um, and so each of them will have their own intricacies but un underlying that is understanding operationally how these companies work and then applying your uh, financial analysis and the valuation metrics appropriate to those particular subsectors. Perfect. Thank you for that detailed answer. And just to actually expand on that a bit more. So you made the switch from consulting to investment banking. Now, how did you actually go on deciding like which bank should I join uh, to work in investment banking? And um, <coughs> the answer there is multifold. Um, the, the things that you will need to consider when joining an investment bank is, um, are you aiming to work purely in advisory. So there's there will be boutiques focused uh, within healthcare um, and they will have their pros and cons. Um, then you will have the more traditional balance sheet backed um, investment banks. So there you would not just be advising clients on um, uh, advisory or uh, M&A strategies. It would more be around the capital raising, the corporate finance aspects of it, how they could potentially raise debt. Um, to do a deal, how they could raise equity, going into a, a listing, ECM. So looking at all aspects. So only some banks will have that platform for that. So traditional big um, bul um, bulge bracket or balance sheet investment banks will be within that space. Um, and the other aspect is then to consider um, advisory boutique. So that's where um, people then would need to consider the, the choice they would, they would make. Um, one thing I would... Uh, suggest to people looking to come into the industry is once you are on a platform it's critical <coughs> from my perspective to try to stay on that platform and get as much deal exposure as possible so really um, to do whatever different things you can be in an ipo mna situation um, advising on a divestment um, or an acquisition um, really to do as many different deals, get as much different corporate finance exposure as you can, and ideally doing it on, on, on the same platform to show um, that you know you, you can be successful on, on, and, and, uh, on, on one particular um, uh, platform. All right, thank you so much for that advice as well. And so obviously you decide to work for the healthcare team. So could you maybe tell us about like what kind of subsectors you cover in the healthcare industry um, sector and like how do clients differ from the traditional institutional clients? Mm. <clears throat> so at, at BNP, my, my role is as, as a managing director really to focus on corporate um, clients and um, uh, clients which may be financial investors but have got healthcare assets. So the, the big large cap pharma clients um, across Europe and, and across the US are people that I'll be speaking to, understanding their capital allocation requirements. So at the moment, if, <clears throat> if we look at the biopharma industry, um, the big pharmaceutical companies are looking to really bolster their, their pipeline. That's the critical element. So we're seeing this trend moving away from the sort of conglomerate strategy towards focused R&D um, pipelines with late stage innovative products which would ultimately uh, be become high margin um, and uh, ideally blockbuster revenue generating um, products. That's where the, the pharma industry is focused and that's been unlocked because of the uh, unlocking you could say of the, the genomic sequence. That's allowed people to become to pr produce very precise treatments around um, based around genomic analysis uh, and so STEM and, uh, STEM and uh, cell technologies have become 
uh, very uh, lucrative there in terms of identifying where the precise cause of a disease is and hence getting a product to a market that will have better efficacy and a side effect profile than, than existing products on the market. So, um, the, again, getting back to your original question, uh, my role would be to be speaking to the M&A teams, the CFOs of these big large cap corporate clients, specialty pharma clients, um, and advising them on where the next um, target could be, where, which could add real be value accretive to their, their pipeline or fit within their the current sales force within whichever therapeutic area that may be. So oncology, CNS focus, critical care in hospitals and so forth. Um, so that becomes a critical component of the dialogue. At the other end of the scale, <clears throat> you'll have private clients that aren't listed, biotechs, family-owned clients um, that are looking at the way valuations are on the stock markets of these type of pharma biotech clients and thinking about what are their next steps in terms of value creation. So that may be either going <coughs> and listing a, a doing an IPO, um, either on the NASDAQ or European or, or Hong Kong Stock Exchange, um, or bringing in private equity or private placement, um, opening up their, their shareholding structure and crystallizing value. So that's that's what we're seeing a lot of as well. Um, the impact of COVID, for example, has been uh, phenomenal in terms of uh, valuations going high, especially within um, diagnostic companies, um, companies that are focusing around mRNA technology. Uh, we're seeing valuations skyrocket uh, again within that area. So um, this is a pretty exciting time um, within the biopharma industry, and it's the right time to be having conversations with um, our both our big corporate clients, but also at the other end, private, smaller uh, clients as well, looking to either raise capital, open up the, the shareholding structure. Perfect, thank you on that. And just to actually follow up on what you uh, last mentioned, what is your outlook for the next couple of years on the future trends of the healthcare industry? As you mentioned, given the current pandemic has developed many medical companies potential. Yeah, and it, it's very exciting. Um, I think, I mean, I've been in the industry over the last sort of 50 to 20 years. Um, this has probably one of the more exciting times that I, that I can remember. Um, and that's partially driven by COVID. <clears throat> so people are thinking about, you know, the impact of COVID on R&D, for example. So we've seen getting mRNA vaccine onto the market took a, um, a record short time in, in, in getting that done. Now, the implication is, how can we apply that um, uh, sort of truncated R&D schedule to other programs, say in oncology or CNS, et cetera? Can the FDA and the other regulatory bodies actually make and optimize the R&D program? So instead of being a, a sort of 10 year um, uh, trial period, can that be truncated, but maintaining the same safety hurdles that, 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 that are required? So that, that's become exciting. That, so, so perhaps there's a way to optimize um, R&D. Um, how can people create value over the next two years? So people are thinking about, look, can we, op can we combine our um, R&D engines? Can we become more efficient in the way we do research? So there's a, uh, going to be a play of consolidation there. As people move away again, like I mentioned earlier, from this um, conglomerate type um, focus to very becoming a lot more focused on R&D, there's going to be a multitude of divestments that, that we're already seeing. Um, so that's that's going on. And secondly, uh, people are taking a lot more view and, and private equity houses are becoming a lot more aggressive in their uh, acquisition uh, sort of strategies, especially for diagnostic companies, for highly innovative companies, um, and, and participating in those processes a lot more, where traditionally PE used to focus on uh, cash generating companies, there where we're seeing them taking on a lot more development risk as, as well. So over the next two years, I see a lot of M&A activity going on. I see a lot of consolidation, a lot of divestment, um, and the industry moving and, and reshaping itself to become um, innovative in nature. And that's where BNP uh, is also quite um, active in, in, again, making sure it's locked in with the innovative companies and making sure its own strategy is focused around um, focusing uh, and aligning its own services to these type of innovative um, companies. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you so much for that insight. I think it's definitely interesting to hear about like all these, yeah, um, different companies and everything. 
And so this is more about um, the next question is a bit more about your career and everything. So given your leadership role at the companies that you worked for and kind of like what qualities did you look for aside from technical ability when promoting analysts, associates and VPs? Yeah, so and I'll speak from a healthcare investment banking perspective. Um, so what's required <coughs> are two things here. One is that the nuts and bolts of investment banking, which will essentially drill down to having a, a good understanding of accounting and, and mm -hmm. be a good understanding of valuation. And, and the two, of course, are, are interlinked. Um, and that uh, you'll get a very good grounding of that at BMP internally on training people to make sure that's, that they're up to speed around that. So that's, that's number one, the ability to really understand the nuts and bolts of the function and of how a company functions, how it's valued, um, and what the, uh, and then that links in quite nicely to the second part is, is, is the sector expertise. So how that <coughs> links in and is shaped within the particular subsector. So what we're looking for people is not necessarily having to have PhDs within microbiology or, bi or biochemistry or pharmacology, um, but at least having an active um, mind in understanding what's going on in the industry, where the consolidation is, where value creation ideas are, and you know, how that that impacts in the advice we should be giving to, to, to companies. So um, the two key things is one, understanding the nuts and bolts of being an investment banker, but two, really understanding the, the industry, what the key themes are and how that's impacting the way people at, at, the, at, at the companies, the CFOs, the CF, CEOs are thinking about capital allocation, are thinking about M&A and are thinking about their, their general strategy. So once you've got um, a combination of those two, you're ready to then start moving up in your levels of client interaction um, and, and your advice giving. Perfect, thank you on that. And I'll just go to the uh, super junior level, to the interns. What advice mm -hmm. would you actually give to current medical or natural science students looking to pursue their career in investment banking? How should they go about that? So um, they should really be as proactive as possible. So they probably have all the, the technical knowledge that, that that's required in terms of the, the science. What they need to do is make sure um, they can really get up uh, on, the, on their, their technical skills of you know doing understanding what a DCF is, trading comps, transaction comps, how that's applied within the, the, the healthcare sector. Um, so understanding that that's going to be critical, understanding what's involved in the day-to-day -day role of an investment banking analyst. So preparing pitch books, um, PowerPoint presentations, uh, preparing the model, the Excel model, or at least, you know, figuring out how it works, um, the different components of that, how it all links together and how the output is presented to, to clients. So really getting as much exposure of that um, and working on as many situations as possible that that's what i would uh, expect at that stage for, for people to be really excited and try to build up their their knowledge base um within the sort of investment banking context and of course applying that to uh, the, the, the the sort of healthcare sector perfect uh well that rounds up for all the questions that we had i just want to thank you again for your time and all the amazing insights i really do believe that it will greatly benefit especially the students coming from those natural science backgrounds and to our viewers please do consider of liking this video and subscribing to our channel thank you very much